Hey, welcome to The Point Church Online. I'm Matt Browning, so excited to be with you today and excited that you came to be with us today. You're in the house of God and we're going to do some uh, phenomenal stuff today. We, of course, have live worship we're going to jump into in a moment. We're going to get a refreshing word and jump into the Bible and hear what God has to say to his people in this season right now. Before we do, I want to, of course, connect with you. I want to know who you are. So, you know, what's great is this live stream, we've been doing this, in case you didn't know, just for you. So we have all of our live campuses across Michigan, the UK and Africa, but this campus, this is online just for you. So I wanna know who you are and jump in the chat, let me know what city you're from. Let's come on, let's go, let's go make it happen. Jump in the chat if you're on the Facebook, if you're watching this on YouTube as a premiere, let us know what's going on. And one of the things you can do, especially if you're loving what we've been doing here together every single week, you can hit that share button. It's a phenomenal way, right as we're getting ready to go, as it's about to go live, real quick hit share. You never know who's gonna get your post, who's gonna watch it live with you and have their life transformed. So with that said, we're going to jump into live worship together here. So go ahead and stand up to your feet if you're watching uh, on your couch. If you're on your treadmill, you're probably already standing. So I don't care where you are in the world. Let's stand up and let's press in and we're going to worship Jesus. I heard 
heard your voice calling my name from the tomb I came alive you do all things well from the tomb I came alive you do all things well and be
forever and always. Thank you, God. I just feel in this moment, it's just this release. Like forever and always, God, I trust you. Forever and always, God, I will serve you. Jesus, I will rise to bring you praise. Let there never be a day that I don't rise to give you praise, God. And in this moment, I just feel like God say, release it. Release that praise. Because your weapon is in your praise. Maybe the only fighting you can do is by singing. Welcome back. Man, worship in this house never ceases to amaze me. I love what God does through the music and through the cheers and through those those soaking moments when we get to just be with him. It's powerful, y'all. It's really, really powerful. And oh, I just love it. Well, hey, before we get into the word, we're about to. So excited for this. Before we do, I do want to take a moment and take up our tithes and offerings. And this is a really important biblical principle that we do as a church. Uh, it says here, I want to read a scripture to you. This is one of my favorite uh, tithing scriptures. There's a bunch of them, you know, in the Old and the New Testament. But this is my favorite. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And it goes on about throwing open the floodgates of heaven. I think it's so important, though, that it says bring the whole tithe. And tithe is translated as a tenth. And when we bring that first tenth, the principle that God's telling us is when we bring that back, God gave us everything in the first place. And when we bring it back to him, there is a, an obedience and there is a trustingness that he has with us and that we have with the Lord that I say, God, you provide for me. You provide all my needs. And therefore, I don't need 100% of what you gave me. I'm going to live fruitfully on the 90. I'm going to bring that back so that your kingdom's blessed. And my wife and I have been living with this principle for years. And I'm telling you, year after year after year, we have some years that things are okay, some years that it's unbelievable abundance, but there's never been a day that we haven't been provided for. And I know that it's through our obedience to the Lord. So let's just take a moment. I want to pray over these ties. And if you're not a member of our church, but you're just watching this on a live stream, you caught this on a quick YouTube clip, hey, you can always, of course, sow what we call offerings into the work we're doing here. It helps to pay for hosting and cameras and just all the other things and buildings and the stuff that it takes to get these messages and the stream out to the world. And we want to increase this 10, 30, 100 hundredfold. Let's pray over this. God, Lord, I thank you for your provision. God, I thank you that it, your kingdom and your storehouse should always be full and that you have created more than enough for us. God, I thank you and I ask that you would take these tithes and offerings and you would press them together. You'd shake them together and you'd make this increase and continue to advance your kingdom and Jesus, that you would touch the lives of the people around us through this money, through these resources, and you would transform lives. In your name, amen. Amen. All right. So, so grateful to be doing this and walking through life together with you. We are going to jump into our word today. So again, I said we're going to hear from Jed Kasica, one of the leaders and a campus leader at the Point Grand Rapids. Um, Jed is finishing. We're going to do th part three of our three-part series, This Is Us. 
This Is Us. I love this series. It's all about relationships. And Jed is jumping into part three of This Is Us. So if relationships are important to you, if you've been suffering with a lack of or an issue going on in a relationship, lean in, pay a special close attention. If you have phenomenal relationships and you just want to take it to the next level and you want to make it as powerful as it can be through Christ Jesus, lean in. Jed has some really, really great wisdom for you from the Word. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome to The Point Online. Hey, I am excited that you are in this moment with me. I think about our weeks and I think about moments like this where we get to gather around the Word of God. How vital, how important, how valuable that is to our lives. And today, as we get into God's Word, we're going to be finishing up our series called This Is Us. And say that in the comments with me. This is is us. And we've been talking about friendships, family, and everything in between. Week one, we looked at friendships. Week two, we heard from Carl, and he shared a great word and focused our attention to family and and marriage and the relationship dynamic, dynamic between parents and kids. It was a great word. If you didn't hear it, if you didn't watch it, check it out. Go back and check it out. I know it's going to bless your life. But today we're going to focus on everything in between because there's all sorts of relationships. There's a whole spectrum of relationships, and I think God's word gives us instruction and insight on how to navigate and have stronger and better relationships across the board. We get key ingredients to strengthening and making our relationships better when we look to God's word. And and I, I want to, if I could title today's message, it'd be this, don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. Someone write that in the comments right now. Someone needs to hear this. Don't rock the boat. And I've got an analogy that we're going to carry into this whole message here. Here's my little visual for you. It's a boat. And, and I think relationships, getting into relationships, is kind of like getting on a boat with people in your life. And so we're going to use this as a visual analogy uh, for the rest of our time together. But I think it is. I think when you get into a relationship with someone, whether it's a marriage or a friendship or it's a family dynamic, you are, it's like you're in a boat with that person. And, and when you think about it in that regard, you know, we don't like when boats get rocked. And I think when you look back at this last year and relationships that have come under pressure and, and, and the pressures of society and culture and just the circumstances we found ourselves in, relationships have been rocked. So I want to preach a message to you today called Don't Rock the Boat, because I think relationships have been tested. They've been rocked. So how do we move on from this moment? How do we move forward to strengthen and better the relationships in our life? You know, it's kind of like when I think about this idea of a boat and being in a relationship, you know, we're all on a journey somewhere. We all have a destination and a purpose in our life and a way that we are moving forward and who we have on the journey makes all the difference. And, and I think you have to learn to relate and connect with the people. Because if you're going to be in a relationship, if you're going to be on a boat with somebody, on a journey to a destination, who you're on that boat with matters. And you have to learn to relate together and learn to be better together if you want to enjoy the journey. And that touches family. If you want to enjoy the journey with your family, they're in that relationship, that boat, then you want to learn some things. If you want to enjoy the journey with your spouse, then you got to learn some things, learn to relate together because you're in the confines of this boat, this relationship. If you want to enjoy the journey with your best friends, listen, you got to learn to relate and be together. Or maybe it's with your coworkers, your classmates, maybe with your coworker, the journey is from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. But listen, you want to enjoy the journey. You got to learn how to relate to each other. And I I really believe that scriptures give us some insight into doing that. 
You know, and I think, again, we're going to, I love this. I'm going to use this the whole time we talk today. If you got a boat, boats are hard to find. This is my son Roman's boat. Uh, they're hard to find these days. I don't think kids are into boats as much. Um, but I'm going to use this as an analogy and a visual for uh, the duration. But I think it's really important to ask yourselves to start right at the beginning and ask yourself who's on the boat. Who are you in relationship with? Who's on the boat. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about how we navigate relationships, but it also has some things to say about who we're actually building relationships with. You know, knowing the people who are getting on the boat is so key. And I think scripture gives us some insight into all different types of relationships. Even for a moment, just speaking to marriage. You know, the question you have to ask yourself, especially is if you're engaged and you aren't married yet, are we equally yoked? You know, there's a scripture in Corinthians that talks about how what does light have to do with darkness? And and it's communicating this truth about how important it is that two people coming into a relationship like marriage it's so important that they have the same foundation, that they're going in the same direction, that their values and their convictions are the same around Jesus, around God. And, and I think if, if I can speak to people who are engaged to think about the relationship, or maybe you're single and you're thinking about who you want to marry, make sure you guys are equally yoked in terms of your faith, in terms of the foundation of your life and the convictions and the values you carry. And so it's important who you bring on that boat with you in marriage. It's important in dating as well. You know, there's a common phrase, you don't date potential. When you're dating potential, it leads to dating problems. You know, you can't, if, however they are now is how they're going to be down the line. You can't change them. You can't make them be different. You aren't their savior. And so sometimes we get caught in relationships. We get caught on the boat with someone who we thought we could change. We thought, you know, if we do the journey long enough, they'll get better. They'll improve. But scriptures show us clear that that's not the case because we don't change people. We aren't their savior. Who you bring on the boat is important. You know, even in friendship, again, we talked about this week week one, so I don't want to spend much time on it, but the importance of having faith-filled friendship, who you're bringing on the journey with you, who you're joined together in relationship is really important because it's either going to strengthen your faith, it's going to better your faith, or it's going to destroy your faith and weaken your faith. You know, what kind of influence do these people have on your life? And who you're bringing on the boat, you're going to get a lot of time together. You're going to do a lot of journey together. You're going to be in close proximity to one another. What kind of influence do they have in your life? So scripture cares about who you bring on the boat. I think it's also important to note that when you bring someone into relationship, when they come on, they're coming with baggage. Everyone has baggage. It's different for everybody, but it's important to note that when it comes to relationship. You know, I think about when Kayla and I go on a journey, I was thinking about this and how if we go on vacation or we're going to visit family and, you know, it could be a weekend getaway and maybe we're getting on the plane. I'm always concerned about how much we're going to pack. And I'm always concerned about going over the weight limit of what we can stow away under the plane. Because here's what I know. If there's too much, I am, I'm going to be the one who ends up carrying the extra baggage. And, and, and the same applies to relationships. It's important to know what baggage are these people bringing into my life? Because it's, what are they bringing on the boat? What are they bringing in the relationship? Because ultimately that's going to weigh down the relationship. And so we have to be mindful of what people are bringing into that space. Because boats have boundaries. I think that's why it's a great analogy. Boats have boundaries. Look at this. It's got a boundary around it. And the reason it has a boundary is it helps safeguard everything inside of it. There's a boundary that keeps what you don't want in out. And what's that? Water. We don't want this thing to get filled with the wrong thing because ultimately it'll cause it to sink. You know, and boats are designed with these boundaries in mind to keep it floating, to keep it moving, and to keep you safe. And in the same way, relationships have boundaries. That's so key to having healthy relationships is to have boundaries in those relationships. 
Marriage has boundaries to it. Your scriptures say, what God has joined together, let no man separate. That's a boundary. You know, it talks about how the marriage bed is undefiled. That's a boundary. And it's an important boundary to keep that marriage healthy, to keep it safe, to safeguard it from things coming in that shouldn't be. You know, and, and when we talk about let no man separate, I love what Carl shared on this recently. He talked about, hey, that doesn't just mean uh, uh, an extramarital affair. That, that could be the kids. Don't let your kids separate your, you from your spouse. Don't let your in-laws separate you from your spouse. There's a boundary to the relationship of marriage, and it's important to safeguard that, to keep those boundaries in place, because if you don't and you let the wrong things in, what's going to happen is the relationship is going to sink. You know, when we're talking about engaged people and boundaries, it's important to safeguard, or I should say dating and engaged people, it's important to have a a, a boundary around your purity and around your intimacy, right? You have to to safeguard the relationship because you aren't married, and Scripture is super clear. Let's get this right. Scripture is super clear on the boundaries of purity and intimacy when you're dating, when you're engaged, prior to marriage. And it's important that you have that boundary in place on your relationship uh, when you're single, when you're dating, when you're engaged. You want to safeguard what's in that relationship. And that's not always physical. Sometimes it's, it, 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 it's what you talk about. It's how you open up your heart. And, and you have to safeguard. There's boundaries in place to help safeguard that relationship and the people in it. You know, friendship. Friendship is another boat that has boundaries. You know, you can only fit so many people on a boat. And you can only fit so many people in your life and in your friendship sphere. Too many people, and it starts to sink. It's not something that can sustain itself. So you have to be mindful of the boundaries of your relationships. Relationships, I love it. The boats that we find ourselves on, relationship is like being on a boat with people. And so we have to be mindful of these things, the boundaries, the baggage, who we bring on board in our life. That all influences the journey that we're on in life. I think when it comes to relationships, I think there are what I'll call rowers of relationships. Rowers of relationships. You know, the oar that you take out and you've got to paddle, whatever that looks like. You're, you're rowing, you're rowing. I think there's rowers in relationships. These are key components, key elements that if we grab a hold of and we apply to our life, they can actually Uh, bring momentum and growth and distance and strength to our relationships. Our relationships can go further, faster when we grab a hold of the rowers, I'll call them, of relationships. And there's just a few that I want to take some time to look at as we talk about relationships. Again, a relationship is like getting on a boat with people. You want to relate to them well. You want to connect well because you're on a journey together and who you bring on your journey is important. I think the first rower of relationship is communication. Proverbs 18 verses 21 says this, Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, a lot of times I think when we read that scripture, I think we shrink it down to mean something very specific. Are, are, are our words life-giving? Are they encouraging? Or, you know, or are they you know, discouraging? They're bringing death. I think we can broaden it a little bit and, and, and talk about how good communication, which is from your tongue, power of life and death is in the power of the tongue. So good communication brings life and bad communication can bring death. Good communication can strengthen and bring momentum and move a relationship forward. And bad communication can bring discord and discomfort and disconnect and death. And, if, you know, there's three of the most important issues of marriage are uh, communication, sex, and money. Those are the top three. When those things are in discord and disarray, then you've got some problems in marriage. And so it's so important that those three things are developed and strengthened. But one of those is communication. So one of the major three issues in marriage 
that can either strengthen or bring life or destroy a marriage, communication, sex, and money. Communication is in those three. Communication is so important to a relationship. And so you have to ask yourself, is my communication clear? Is my communication honest? Is my communication honoring? You know, one of the things we do as a church, we have this thing called life languages, which you'll probably hear more and more about as time goes on. It's been a part of our church journey for a long time, and and we use it because it's a great communication tool. And it's great for everyone and and how we communicate with people and how we also understand how we communicate. And so I want to use uh, life languages, some of the understandings that it brings for, for Kayla and I in our marriage. I'll use this as a great example. And maybe this might resonate with you, but Kayla is a responder, which means her need in communication is acceptance to be heard and to be seen. So when she feels those things from me, Man, we're communicating well. My needs in communication are undivided attention and personal space. What does that mean? It sounds like a conundrum when it says undivided attention, but also I need you to give me personal space. Undivided attention means that you're listening to me, that you don't interrupt me, that I'm able to share and express where I'm at. And I've got your full attention. You're not on your phone. You're not doing dishes or whatever. It's like, I've got your full attention. You're not watching the show. But personal space means I need time to, uh, uh, to, to process in my own space. And when you communicate and you give me that, then, then I feel like we're communicating and connecting well. And that's just an example of how communication is so valuable and vital to helping bridge the gap between people and connect with people in relationship. And I'd encourage you to, to take the life languages test. I'd encourage you to understand it more and apply it to your own life. Kayla and I have used it as an amazing tool in our marriage. But beyond that, I use it in the workplace. I use it in friendships. It's just a great way to understand how people communicate. And here's the thing. When there's good communication, there's life. When there's good communication, we can be growing together and growing closer together. And I think oftentimes when there's bad communication, it, it, it can lead to conflict because there's also, sometimes there's, there's that phrase, there's different expectations leads to conflict. And, and, and conflict isn't a bad thing. And I want to say this because I think someone needs to hear it when it comes to conflict. Conflict is something you need to lean into and embrace. Now, I'm not saying, don't hear me wrong, that you need to go seek out conflict and seek out argument and seek out, you know, having these hard conversations with your, the people in your life, the relationships. What I am saying is that you shouldn't run away from it, that you have to embrace it and lean into it because healthy conflict leads to stronger relationships. Healthy conflict leads to deeper relationships. Healthy conflict means that I'm not sweeping anything under the rug. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, we've never fought. We've never had intense fellowship, as we like to call it. You know, we've never had a conflict. I think then somebody's probably not being honest in that relationship. Somebody's not being clear about where they're at. Someone might be passive aggressive. Someone might be sweeping things under the rug because there's going to be conflict. We're human and relationships and be deep and intimate and they can bring out the best in us, they can bring out the worst in us, but there's going to be conflict. But if you ignore it, then it's going to lead to death. But if you embrace it, you lean into it and you seek restoration and understanding and listening and hearing, you're going to strengthen your relationship. It's going to get better over time. I think about history and how so many of the greatest innovations, so many of the greatest advancements in civilization came out of a moment of crisis and conflict and hardship. But rather than look at it just as a challenge, we look at it as an opportunity to grow. And I think that's how we should look at communication and look at conflict is that we're leaning in to grow. We're leaning in to understand someone. We're leaning in to bring restoration and peace to the relationship. So communication is one of those rowers. If you've got good communication, there's going to be life. You're going to enjoy the journey. There's going to be joy. There's going to be peace. There's going to be understanding. But if there's bad communication or someone's not willing to change and and bring better communication, it's going to feel like they stopped rowing. It's going to feel like the paddle stopped and they're just putting a halt and it's going to create chaos and disorder and disconnect. So 
Communication, apply it to relationships, get better at it. Learn to understand how people communicate. Learn to understand how your spouse and your friends and your family and the people you work with communicate so you can connect better and grow deeper in relationships. The second row is this, consistency. Proverbs 3, verse 3, or Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 says this, hold on to loyal love and don't let go and be faithful to all you've been taught. Let your life be shaped by integrity with truth written on your heart. Consistency. That's huge. You ever known someone to be inconsistent? You ever known someone to be inconsistent in, in their behavior? One day they're doing this, the next day they're doing that, or inconsistent in their communication. They said this yesterday, but then they changed their mind quickly the next day, and it just seems like this happens over and over again. It, a better way to say it is like you don't know what you're going to get with the person. You don't know what you're going to get in how they talk to you or how they treat you or, or their follow-through. You, know, you don't quite trust their word. That's what can happen when there's inconsistency. There's a lack of dependability. There's a lack of trust. But when we're consistent in our actions, in our character, when we're consistent in our words, it brings trust and dependability and it draws people closer together. You know, I think about in my own life, I'll be honest with you, I haven't been the most consistent in eating healthy and making good decisions with what I eat and what I drink. And what that's led to is an inconsistency in my health and in my weight and how I live my life. There's an inconsistency. You might look at a picture of me from a few years ago. I look great. And then the next few li- few years later back, it's like, whoa, it's a different person. What's going on here, right? There's an inconsistency. Now, listen, I'm working on it. I want to get better. I, I, I want to be healthy. I want to be strong. I want to be consistent in my decisions when it comes to my health and my eating, all of that, right? But it takes discipline. It takes being consistent. It takes showing up. It, it, it takes uh, uh, being true to your word, and it takes, you know, making a decision and sticking to it. It takes saying something and sticking to it. If there's a consistency, It takes behavior being consistent each and every day in my health. And the the word consistency comes from Latin, meaning to stand firm. To stand firm. To be consistent means to stand firm. To be consistent means to be dependable. To be consistent means to be trustworthy. And we need that in our relationships. Because if you don't know who you're going to get the next day, you don't know what they're going to say the next day, it's up and down, left and right. You're never going to go that far and deep with the relationship. There's always going to be this mistrust, this, this lack of dependability. And so I want to encourage you, Grab the rower of consistency and start applying that to your life. Be consistent. Show up. Be dependable. Be trustworthy. Do what you say you'll do. Uh, 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 Let your character and your integrity make a commitment to your integrity. That's what it says here. Let your life be shaped by integrity. Let there be wholeness in your life. And third, uh, rower of relationship, I'll call it, is commitment. Commitment is so important to relationships. It's, that feels like common sense. But when you look at the state of relationships, when you look at the state of marriages, when you look at the state of culture, especially right now, commitment does not feel like a high priority on people's lists. It doesn't feel like it's there. You know, 2020 has pushed relationships to the limit. And in some cases, it's pushed them so far that they've fallen apart. You know, to go back to this analogy, you've had people in a relationship, and some of them have just jumped ship. Some of them have just sabotaged the boat, sabotaged the ship, and caused it to sink. Or some of us saw that there were issues in the relationship, and rather than deal with them, and rather than work on them, they just decided to get out. You know, culture doesn't seem to place a high priority or high value on commitment. I mean, you look at that when you see people who've been married. Let's just talk about marriage for a moment for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, their whole life. You know, we celebrate that because it's amazing. It's a milestone. 
But to be honest, I think in some people's minds, it almost feels unattainable. Like, is that real? I mean, it, it feels like this is a one in a million couple. They seem like they're just the perfect people that <laughs> they've been able to make it this long. But I think it goes to something deeper. I don't think these people are abnormal. I think they've just made a commitment. You know, they've, they've weathered the storms. They've gone through thick and through thin. They've been there in the hard times. They've been there in the good times. They've been there in each other's corner. They've worked through conflict. They've worked on their communication. They've made it a, their relationship a priority, and they've stuck to it. They've been consistent. They've stood firm. They've held on to loyal love, and they've held on to faithfulness, and they've, they, 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 the integrity has shaped their life and their relationship. I think commitment is so important when it comes to relationships and not just marriage, but friendships, not just friendships, but family. The idea of commitment. I'm making a commitment in this relationship that no matter what comes our way, we're going to stick to each other. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse 12 says this, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I think commitment is rooted in love. It's held together by Christ. He's that third strand. I've said this before. He's the third strand. When Christ is in the middle of a relationship, he's the one who can hold things together like nothing else. And commitment is rooted in Love. Paul shows us what kind of love we need because I think we've watered down the idea of love to something that just means that I accept you or it's a feeling and I can fall out of that feeling and I can fall into that feeling. No, love is so much more. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. That's the kind of love we need at the center of our relationships. That's the kind of love we need to build our relationships on. That's the kind of love we need in our lives. You know, I think about the state of relationships and just navigating this season and, and how relationships seem to be under such great strain and pressure. And some have fallen apart. Some have been lost. Uh, some of them have gotten stronger and better. But I just want to encourage you wherever you're at today, again, with this analogy of being on a boat. You know, there's a story in, in Mark chapter four that talks about the disciples being on a boat and having to weather a storm. And they didn't know what to do. They thought, it was going to lead to shipwreck, that the, 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 the boat might sink. But then they remembered they had a savior on the boat with them. They had someone they could run to in that moment of need, that moment of crisis. And I just want to encourage some people here that maybe, maybe you're facing storms. Maybe the storms of life have come against your relationships, a friendship or a family member or, or, or a marriage, whatever it could be. And you just feel like the boat's rocking. The boat's rocking. This might be it. This might be the moment we see shipwreck. This might be the moment that things capsize. And I want to encourage you that in Christ that you have a savior. And his name is Jesus. And he's someone who you can call upon in a moment. And that's exactly what the disciples did. The disciples woke him up and they said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And the wind died down and it was completely calm. I just wonder if maybe you're watching this right now and there's relationships in your life that seem to be facing storms or in the middle of it. And you're not sure what's going to happen. And maybe you're losing hope. And maybe you think this is it. I just want to encourage you that Jesus is right there with you. Jesus is there and he's ready to move. And maybe in this moment, what you need to do is you need to call out for him and say, Jesus, we need your help. Help us. I believe he'll move in a moment. 
I believe he can speak to the storm to bring peace. I believe he can speak and move in a relationship and move in someone's heart and bring healing. I believe he can move in someone's life and bring restoration. I believe he can move in someone's life and bring hope. I believe he can, I, I believe he can bring peace to that relationship, to your relationship. Maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's a friendship, maybe it's the, a family member. Whoever it is, I believe Jesus can do a miracle. He can do it right now. He can do it in this moment. And it's on us, even in this moment, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the relationships in your life. But I'm believing that Jesus is going to move in this moment, that he can bring hope, bring peace, bring restoration, that he can bring healing, that he can calm the storms, that he can settle the boat. And we need to invite him in, in this moment. So I just want to pray for you as we finish out this series, as we finish out this talk that as we continue to move forward, that when we say this is us, and we're talking about the relationships of our life, that we're making a declaration about this is how we're gonna live our life, that this is how we're gonna relate with people, that this is how we're gonna connect with people, that this is how we're gonna love people. And it's not gonna be like the world, it's gonna be like Christ. And we're gonna have him rooted in the foundation of our relationships. So let me pray for you. And maybe if you're watching now and you think that's me, there's the, the relationship comes to mind or a person comes to mind and you just know things are rocking and you're just praying, don't rock this boat. Jesus wants to move in your life and in that relationship in this moment. So let me pray for you here today. God, we thank you that you've called us and created us to relate to people, to be in relationship to enjoy this journey together with others and friendships and family and in marriages. And I just pray right now for every person who's watching this, who may have a relationship that's on the rocks, who may have a relationship that's facing storms, who not sure if this thing is going to capsize, if this thing is going to sink and fall apart. God, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would move in those relationships, that you would bring peace, that you would bring healing and wholeness and restoration. God, I pray that you would do what only you can do. Nothing is impossible for you. And so we lift up these relationships to you right now, God, and we ask that you would act, that you would speak, that you would bring peace and wholeness and restoration right now. Lord, as we move forward, God, that you would strengthen the relationship and the bond that we have with one another. God, that we would learn to relate and connect as the word of God instructs us to. That we would stand out, that community and relationship within the church globally would look different, that would feel different, that would be different than what the world is trying to do without you. God, I just pray this all right now in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, I just want to thank you for joining us today. And you know, maybe you're in a place where talking about relationships, you've never made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe that's a relationship that you've never started. I just want to let you know that God loves you, that Jesus loves you. God sent his son to die on the cross so that he could be in relationship with you, that relationship could be restored, that we deal with our sin, that we deal with our brokenness, and that relationship and our lives could be restored in him. And so maybe today is the day you need to make that decision to say yes to Jesus, because he's inviting you. This is an invitation to relationship. And if that's you here today and you want to make that decision, I'd love to lead you in a prayer to do that very thing. And you can just pray these words after me and, and, and just believe them in your heart and confess them with your mouth and let someone know that you've made this decision. And just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins and of going my own way. Today, I put my faith in you. I believe that you died on the cross, that you were buried in the grave, and that you rose again for my salvation. Come into my heart. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Amen. 
Hey, welcome back. Welcome back, man. What a word. And 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 what and what a prayer at the end. I just you can feel the presence. That's powerful. And listen, if you were watching this, if you've been going through worship, listening to that message, and I know that God spoke to you through it. And if you prayed that prayer with Jed at the end, if you prayed that prayer and made Jesus the Lord of your life, especially if you did that for the first time, <laughs> congratulations. And we want to know about it. We want to help you. We are here for you. The most important thing I want you to know is you're not in this alone. God has planted us into families and into communities for a reason. We are meant to walk through salvation and walk through this life with others. So if whether you have that now or you're not sure, where do I go? What's my next step? Do I need to get baptized? The answer is yes. Do I need to get baptized in the spirit? The answer is yes. Do I need to be part of a church, a local body? The answer is yes. But if you have uh, questions like that and where do I go, connect with us and you can go to thepointchurch.com slash connect and let us know what's going on. We will help you to get plugged into a local body. If you're not local in one of our campuses, there are lots of phenomenal churches of Christ out there for you. We want to help you and find that for you. We want to get a Bible in your hands and hey, just ask and you shall receive. We got a Bible with your name on it waiting for you. You just got to let us know you're out there. So thepointchurch.com slash connect, put it down in the chat, uh, head over to the website and let us know. So, so excited for you. This is a big day. Um, Let's continue on because, you know, this is a big day, but it's also the first day of all of the rest of the days of you walking this out, just as I am and just as everyone here at The Point is. So, so excited. Thank you again to Jed for that phenomenal word. Thank you to our worship team for just bringing the fire and bringing that uh, that music together and bringing our worship. And I'm Matt Browning. I'll see you next week here at The Point Church online. <laughs>